Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to Warren Church of Christ. If all elders and, and chaplains would sit down, we could start. <laughs> uh, welcome to our church service. Even during our socially distanced time, we hope you still feel welcomed and friendly, at our, and that we're friendly to you at our church. Glad to have everyone here. Uh, as we start out today, I love what Psalm 27, verse 4 says. It's King David. So we all know that King David wrote a lot of the Psalms. He says, one thing I have asked from the Lord, that I shall seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. Amen? Amen. That's a beautiful verse. Today, uh, as we start our church service, we're going to continue to allow you to know of ways that you can be serving or things that we are doing. And I want to remind you that we have almost all of our time slots filled, but the Salvation Army bell ringers, they are way down on stations this year. So for a second year in a row, our church is going to sign up for a Saturday to over at the Dollar General here in Warren, sign up to ring bells for 30 minutes or one hour sessions. We only have a, a, few, a few slots left open, so if you're online, text me or make a comment on our service, or if you're here, sign up after church, but we'd love to have you ring bells and raise money for a great cause. Also, uh, I, I want to pray and then turn the floor over to... Shana Fortney, who's going to share some amazing things that have happened and that will continue to happen at our church. Some are service and some are worship geared. So have your ears open and your hand and pen ready to write some of, these, some of this stuff down. Let's pray together, and then after she's done, we'll sing together. So let's pray. God, uh, we are we're calling out to you this morning. We're praying that you're that your glory will shine in this room, that your glory will shine in our hearts wherever we are. Father, it's our prayer that you will be honored and glorified because of what we're doing and because of what you've done, because of our singing and, and giving you the praise, and because of the fact that you, God, are the creator of everything. We pray that no matter what our attitudes were coming in, that they will change and be filled, our, our hearts will be filled and our attitude will leave here not only wanting to glorify you and praising your name, but to having the, the name of Jesus Christ, our, the Messiah, our Savior, on the tips of our tongue wherever we go. God, lead us in this endeavor, we pray, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Um, I'm uh, just making a quick announcement about caring for kids. Um, I know Shanna will, Shanna will properly thank the church and all those involved for their um, help with the meals that we have filled our freezers with uh, to be distributed uh, when families receive their gifts. This year, Caring for Kids is doing um, things a little bit differently just to mitigate, mitigate um, Obviously, the, the, the COVID and the chances that we will, um, I'm sorry, the, the COVID um, sickness and uh, just to be a little bit safer. Um, so some changes have happened, and one of those changed, which kind of hurts all of our hearts here at <laughs> Warren Church of Christ. So many of us loved helping wrap gifts. Now, if that's you, um, we still have some service opportunities for you when it comes to that. Um, we need some volunteers um, Caring for Kids needs some volunteers for assisting families when they receive their gifts because they're going to, um, they have a different process this year. Those opportunities involve uh, the days of uh, December 11th, it's a Friday, uh, 12th, Saturday, and the 13th, Sunday. So if you have any free time, um, please see me, and if you want to, inv to be involved that way, um, they they really need our, need some help uh, for some volunteers for dis their, dis their new their uh, 2020 distribution <laughs> day um, that will look very different than what we're used to. Um, so um, the other uh, opportunity is also on that day, we need just a couple people to help uh, pass out the meals that we have made. Um, all of our freezer meals, each family, we were used to packing our boxes here at packing the boxes, the meal bags um, for uh, distribution with the gifts. 
um, and the Santa bags and the what, none of that's happening this year. Um, but you will be able to serve in that way as well by um, helping us get some of those meals out to the families that come for their gifts um, to Markle Church of Christ. So if you want any more information on that, please see me. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Um, just a quick update on the Feed the Flock ministry. We had over 180 meals made by our church, um, either in our homes or here at the church kitchen um, in about a five weeks time span. So can we get a hallelujah for that? Right? right? Um, um, we had 15 volunteers the day of the 100 meals that were made here at the church for the Caring for Kids ministry. And we had 12 volunteers make, make a total of 50 meals at, our, at their homes. And then the other 30 plus that make the 180 were from the three weeks prior to the Caring for Kids um, meal day. Um, and um, our freezers, we have the two big freezers. We got freezers above the refrigerators in there, like full. It's awesome to see. Um, just what this church has done. Um, Rick and Elaine, on their own leading, bought some canned vegetables for the Caring for Kids that are going to be passed out, too, with that. Um, and I just wanted to um, add that, you know, each meal prep day is an example of the unity of body of Christ. The scripture, instead of speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Ephesians 4, 15 through 16. Everyone jumps into these roles um, and stations on these days to make everything go smoothly, willing to get their hands in on some of the raw meat to make dishes, to cut up onions, wash dishes, open endless amounts of cans on that day. We had just an endless amounts of cans um, to be, you know, cooked, cracked open, um, staying later than anticipated, but everyone walks away with the, their hearts full. And we have had some people, or we even had someone that was led by the Spirit to show up on that day of parent caring for kids to come and just help at the last minute. And we needed that help because we were running over time. So um, just, it was such a blessing, and it's been such a blessing, and it's continuing to be such a blessing, that meal ministry. Um, for the feed the flock and just and meals are going out already not just for the caring for kids but through our ministry here um, and just you know over the next couple um, weeks before those meals are distributed if you are here at the church or stop by go pray over those freezers you can pray over those freezers and pray for the families that are going to be accepting those meals and that their hearts might be changed to know Christ so that's feed the flock um, holy ground going to read some scripture here. But whatever was to my profit, I now consider a loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through the faith in Christ. The righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. And so somehow to attain the resurrection from the dead. But I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward to Christ Jesus. But our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that we will become like his glorious body. Um, that's Philippians 3, 7 through 11, 12, 14, 20 through 21. Through that, we need to be yearning, pursuing, and chasing after God so that we can help teach others the word of God so that they may know of his amazing love for them. The idea of holy ground, which we haven't done for a while due to COVID, um, was to come together and be rooted in the word, to dive deep into it, and to make it applicable. The idea came from the book Radical by David Platt. He met in persecuted countries for hours and for days in a row in quiet, dark rooms, 
meeting with believers to teach God's word so that they can spread it to other house churches carefully, meaning their lives were in danger for spreading God's word. That could happen to us. We never know, okay? Um, we have had different looks of a service for our holy grounds over the past four or five years. I don't know. We've been doing it for quite a while. But we are convinced we need to be now more than ever prepared in the word and then sharing that with those around us. So on Friday, December 11th at 6 p.m., we are going to come together for around five hours to take part of Secret Church 1, the survey of the Old Testament. There will be four one-hour sessions of David Platt examining a rather large portion of the Bible that many Christians find confusing and even intimidating, the Old Testament. This study looks at the... Um, this study looks at the Old Testament and its literary, historical, and theological dimensions, and it offers a survey of all 39 books. As we'll see, there's more here than a collection of good moral principles and examples. The God-inspired words of the Old Testament points us to Christ, to his church, and to God's plans for all nations. Um, so we'll, go, we'll do a quick brief review, but then he puts it all together, and it's every word is so amazing in these um, teachings that he's doing, and um, it's it's you just want to keep listening more and more and more from these from these teachings. It's just it's awesome. Um, so we will have a few short breaks during that time. There'll be times of prayer for the Peace Cure Church, and possibly a brief time of worship. We will socially distance. You can wear your mask um, when up and about. If you need to get up and kind of walk around, just stay awake during that evening. Um, and we'll be providing some type of babysitting. Um, but we need you to sign up to know how many study guides to get, which will be a small fee, but please don't let that hinder you from coming. I do want to encourage the middle school and high school arrived students to make this a priority, along with all believers or non-believers in this church that want to know God's word more. Um, because we need to get this word out, and we need to be sharing God's word so people get to know Jesus. Um, if you are uncomfortable about coming to, during, due to the current situation of COVID, we will find a way to get the materials to you, and we will find a way to get you to be able to watch these um, sessions because we feel that is that important. Um, you know, just over the last couple of weeks, Ethan has read from the Bible that we need to go and spread the word, and we can't wait to do so. We have to be doing this now, and we need to be getting in, in learning. Um, so I just pray that you guys will take this to heart um, and that we'll get to see, you know, quite a few of you come to Secret Church. And even if five people come, ten people come, those ten people will multiply and keep multiplying and keep multiplying. So um, let's worship.
to share with you from Galatians. Sorry, Galatians. Um, we hear from Paul. Um, he describes um, what. Well, what, what, I'm sorry, I meant to say he will, um, he will defend Christ in so, many of, so much of his writing um, by saying it's, it's not me when he receives praise and when he decides, um, or I'm sorry, when he makes, um, makes his journeys and when he is preaching, um, he, he re sometimes receives praise about um, uh, Christ's power and what uh, and what the things he's doing, but he constantly points people back to Christ um, by saying, it's not me. It's not me. It's the power that is in me through Christ. He says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Amen. The next song that we will sing together um, as a body um, is Yet Not I, But Through Christ in Me. And so many of the songs that we sing are thoughtfully picked out, thoughtfully chosen, and that is also done through the power of Christ, not by us. Um, we here at, church, at uh, Warren Church of Christ believe that when uh, song services are planned, um, that's, it's through the power of Christ um, that we do that. Um, <clears throat> and this one is no exception in that uh, we get to hear the whole story. We get to hear of all the things and proclaim all of the things that Christ has done for us and who I he is for us. So please join us.
Now before you sit, uh, at this time we invite you to uh, bring some communion back to your seats and we will partake that together. Good morning, everybody. For our communion invitation this morning, I wanted to do something just a little bit different. So I asked our Revive students uh, this simple question. What does communion mean to you? And their answers had a wide range, uh, but I want you guys to hear what they said. And following their answers, Ella and Abigail are going to be reading Romans 5, verses 6 to 9. Communion is taking the time to remember what Jesus did for you. Communion is taking the body and the blood of Christ. Um, communion is when you take the bread for Jesus' body and the grape juice for his blood and it takes away your sins. Communion is a time to remember how Jesus died on the cross for us to forgive us for our sins. Communion is when you're like supposed to remember what Jesus did for you. It's like when his um, body is the bread and his blood is the wine. When we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners. Now, most people would not be willing to die for an upright person, though someone might perhaps be willing to die for a person who is especially good. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. And since we have been made right in God's sight by the blood of Christ, he will certainly save us from God's condemnation. You can see that their answers range from just taking the bread and the juice to remembering uh, what Jesus did for us. And we see in this Romans passage uh, that God sent Jesus to die for us while we were still sinners. This isn't because we aren't good enough, but because God loved us so much that he sent Jesus to die in our place. The love that caused Christ to die for us is the same love that sends the Holy Spirit to live in us and guide us every day. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead is the same power that saved us and is available for us to use in our daily lives. Now I would like you to take a couple of minutes to reflect on what Jesus has done for you. Hi guys, it's that time again, the time when all the kids who are here at church are going to get up and head over to kids worship to learn more about God with me over in the kids worship room. But I know some of you guys are watching from home. I wanted to let you know we haven't forgotten about you. Whether it's been one or two weeks that you've had to be at home or you haven't made it back to church at all yet, or if you're worshiping from far away, I wanted to let you know that we love you too and we have resources to help you learn more about God from home. So if that's your case, if you aren't able to join us here in church, I would love it if you would reach out to me. You can either use my cell phone number or you can email me at liz at warrenchurchofchrist.org and, and let me know that you would like some resources and I'd be happy to give you some stuff. We've got all sorts of really cool stuff to help you learn more about God from home. So I hope to see you in person soon, but until then, have a great week. Okay, everybody, so Shanna said we're a church that goes. I agree with that. And our youth group explained that we're a church that honors Christ's sacrifice. Great job. Not only great job speaking and reading, but great job holding up that board when you're reading that scripture. That was cool. It was creative. Whoever thought of that. Uh, our church also needs to be a church that prays. We're a praying church because God's listening. Amen? Amen. And I would like us to have our bulletins handy. The online bulletin will be available after church today, but those of us that are here, we have our bulletins on the reverse side from the order of our service. You'll see several names you can pray for. You see ways you can be involved. I have a few things you can add to our prayer list today. So in addition to praying for these people, please add the following. So Joe and Becky Hartley, they're not here today. They, say, they send their best, and uh, Becky would like us to pray for her family because her uncle Joe, Joe Huber, uh, he passed away. He had been battling COVID, and he got to come back to Heritage Point. Is it, he did come back to Heritage Point, right? But uh, he did Went pass away. Went to, in and out of the hospital, um, but did spend his final days at Heritage Point. Uh, that's Becky Hartley's uncle, Joe Huber. Uh, thank you for praying for their family. I also had a request of prayer from Kim Jordan. Kim's family is all from Michigan, 
And uh, her brother up there is Kurt Kwiatkowski. And Kurt has an upcoming surgery this Thursday. And she said uh, she would appreciate it if our church family would lift up Kurt. And just she'll pass along that uh, a lot of people down in the Warren area are thinking of him and praying for him. So surgery on Thursday, prayers requested. And I said, sure thing. Now, this has been a pretty tough week for, uh, for the Pew family. Jerry and Sharon, they live in Ossian at the uh, nursing home there. They're still hoping. They were hoping before COVID to have about a three to six month window to transfer over to Heritage Point. That has been postponed until all this ends. But Sharon has spent a few days in the hospital this week, and she hopes to get out soon. But she is battling kidney stones and a few other, uh, a few other health issues. So let's lift up Sharon. And not to leave out Jerry, Jerry says, uh, they've been married, I forget what he said, 60-something years, and he's like, yeah, we've been to part before. One time, back when I was in uh, uh, National Guard basic training, I wasn't with her for a weekend. And he said, pray for me, you know, she's gone for the next few days, and it's killing him. So prayers for both Jerry and Sharon Pugh, as she hopes to heal and get back with them over in Ossian. The last one is praying for a church that we support, the churches we support. Our church here, um, we do our best to, to pay it forward, not because our fellow man tells us to, but because, but because, because God tells us to. Our goal is to be generous with uh, local churches and missionaries that spread God's word. And our mission of the month right now is the Latin American uh, ministries. And this is primarily represented by Billy and Betty Loft. And they're in the Nicaragua churches, uh, and there has been a second or even a thir- two or three, two hurricanes that have hit that area. You know, when a hurricane, I was actually talking to Roberta, a hurricane hit Florida, she got six inches of rain, and there might have been some damage, but there wasn't a catastrophe there, right? It's survivable. It's a little different in Latin America and the Honduras area as well. Uh, so let's lift up our church, the Latin, our mission, the La- Latin American Ministries, we have uh, the churches down there. We have people that we support whose homes have been destroyed from the winds, from the flooding. And I think it would be appropriate. I know several of you, for each mission of the month, you uh, set aside certain amounts of your tithe. You go above and beyond to support them. This would be an appropriate time, especially just like we had supported WAMA over the last few weeks. And we raised, uh, I haven't gotten a tally yet, but I know it's over $500, including our missions money, maybe even a lot more than that. Thank you for doing that. Maybe you'll consider the Latin American ministries, uh, the two hurricanes that have devastated the church family down there and many others they plan to help. Maybe you'll consider supporting uh, them as well. Let's go to God for our prayer requests, those who have lost people, those with surgeries, those wanting to come home, and those that are going through a devastation right now, and so much more. Let's pray together. God, not only is your Son our Lord, But because of him, we have you as our provider. We know just like a a father and mother to a child who cares for and wants to see a child do well, we know you care about us. You want what's best for us. We don't always understand that. We don't always agree with that. But God, we will always pray for your will, for your love to be seen and your will to be done in our lives. So for our family that's watching online, For our family that's here uh, in person, for our guests, we ask, God, that we will all take comfort in knowing that you have everything in your control, and we ask that you will be there and support us like we know you will. Guide us and allow us to see your presence. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Well, happy Thanksgiving one last time, because hold your breath, it's time to move on to Christmas, right? <laughs> well, sometimes, how about every time, every time we come to our church, especially on a Sunday morning, we can reset, we can uh, start fresh, we can fill our spiritual cup until it overflows. And today I want to share with you in a moment a passage that comes from Proverbs, the fourth chapter. Go ahead and turn there. That one's not going to be available. Most of our scriptures today are going to be on the screen. Uh, but what you see behind me, I kind of made this up. I found, a, I found an image that I could use and I put my own words in there. But what do you know? And then the answer is God loves us. What do you know? Jesus transforms us. Well, we have a, a heart, metaphorically speaking, that God has given us. And he allows us to go in the direction we want. And I pray that as we hear his words, especially here out of Proverbs, that we'll allow, that we'll allow his wisdom, his wisdom to not only fill us up, but to guide your path. Okay? And as we begin, if you turn over to Proverbs 4 and make that beautiful noise of the Bible, script, Bible pages turning, <laughs> chapter 4 of Proverbs, its heading from my Bible says, Wisdom is supreme. I can appreciate that. And I wrote a personal note at the beginning of chapter 4. It says, uh, be a godly parent. Okay? Do you have children? Do you, or do you have people under you, nieces and nephews, grandchildren? Uh, hear that. Be a godly parent. Read through the fourth chapter. Uh, just like, even that first line. Listen, my sons, to a father's instruction. Pay attention and gain understanding. Okay, well, a lot of us need to be that father or that mother who a child can learn from. There you go. There, there's a mini sermon. That has nothing to do with today's sermon. I want you to go a few verses later. If you go through chapter 4, verse 7 reminds us to get wisdom because it's so important. So maybe you need to seek out a, a mentor. But I want us to read the last seven or so verses of Proverbs chapter 4 together. Uh, I have also written in my Bible, this is worth memorizing. Okay, so circling verses 20 through 27, and maybe even highlighting verse uh, 23 specifically. Let's read this out loud, and then uh, just follow along. I'll give you a little devotion on it, and then we're going to dig, on what, dig into what God wants us to know together. Here's what it says. My son, pay attention to what I say. Listen closely to my words. Do not let them out of your sight. Keep them within your heart. And I appreciate the church family that makes this a priority right here. This is what it says. For they, my words, God's, God's words, for they are life to those who find them, and health to a man's whole body. Above all else, let's pay attention here. Go ahead and say, say those words with me again. Above all else. Okay, what's, what's that mean? Above all else. Make a high priority right here. Guard your heart. For it is the wellspring of life. And we'll explain that in a moment. The wellspring of life. Put away perversity from your mouth. Keep corrupt talk far from your lips. Let your eyes look Straight ahead, fix your gaze directly before you. Make level paths for your feet, and take only ways that are firm. Do not swerve to the right or to the left. Keep, uh, keep your foot from evil. Uh, as I was working on a message to share, kind of after our Thanksgiving time, and yet before our Christmas time, my, my preacher from my youth, Waller Rendell, he sent me a newsletter a few months ago of, a, of an outline of what God wants you to know. It's from Victor Knowles, and it was full of scriptures. In fact, it was only scriptures. And uh, I'm very thankful to have an amazing audio-visual team who helps me out. We're going to see several verses pop up in a few moments that are filled with things that God wants us to know. So I thank them. I thank you. You're welcome to turn. You're welcome to write down. But we'll have the majority of these verses on the screen. But I want to start... With what do you need to know? It's not only does God ask us, in fact, tell us to seek his face through wisdom, but it should be a priority to fill your heart with godly things and allow those other things to just leave. So here's what I'm thinking of. Now more than ever, we need to be a people of good cheer. Does that make sense? Being happy and joyful. In fact, uh, I got to pray for my Thanksgiving meal, and my aunt had on a shirt, and it said, choose joy. 
How true is that? We have a choice to make, choosing the, 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 the attitude we're going to have. Well, <clears throat> what can you do in a kind of a crazy time? I don't want to beat a dead drum. Uh, I don't want to beat on a drum that just keeps on going. How about that? But with COVID and the election, everything else that's going on, we have a lot of things we could choose other than joy. But I wrote down three things just going on. They popped into my head just this week. Have you got your Christmas tree up yet? That's a small thing you can do. Uh, it's a traditional thing. It's after Thanksgiving. Hopefully you didn't put it up yet, and hopefully you don't forget to, get to take it down until February. But get your Christmas tree up. I, Misty, got, we got ours out, and I have about a dozen Christmas tree ornaments that I love to look at and I have memories. And in fact, uh, uh, one that was a gift our first year here, and we, we, uh, we each remember a different person giving it to us, so we're not sure who. Uh, we, we haven't ever done to two families, but we were given a uh, Warren Church of Christ Christmas ornament with our, with our church painted on the outside of it. And I love looking at that. I love having that. You know, it, it cheered me up. So if you can paint with me to my, to my right, to your left, you know, maybe you need to put up your nativity scene. Thank you to the Sparks family and to Lori Blair as well for helping, but you know, does this kind of give you a positive attitude when you see this? Whether it's the, the manger scene or whether it's thinking of your youth with the Christmas trees or the snow kind of around here, that part can wait a few more, a few more weeks for me. That's okay. <laughs> but can you put up a Christmas tree? Sounds small, right? Well, uh, can, you, can you get your Christmas cards rolling? Uh, do even more than normal. How about that? Can you work out some Christmas cards? Send out an extra five. You can send those to a friend or someone who's in isolation this year. You know, I like getting a Christmas card, but someone who's not around people will probably really appreciate getting a Christmas card. Uh, you can go on down the list. You could order flowers for a friend or, again, someone in isolation. Christmas cards, Christmas trees, flowers. You know, what do you know? Well, let's let me encourage you to choose joy. Does that make sense? Now, if you still have your Bibles open to our main passage, it's Proverbs chapter 4, and verse 23 is, uh, Proverbs 4, verse 23, above all else, guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of everything, of life. And what does it mean to, to guard your heart? What's it mean to do this? How do you do this? It's easy to kind of, to kind of give an instruction or to read a scripture, and then you wonder, what am I to do? Now, if you think about your heart, you know, maybe, maybe you hear your own heartbeat sometimes when you're so quiet, or maybe you're laying close enough to a child or to a spouse, you can hear their heartbeat. The heart really isn't anything that uh, dramatic to, uh, you know, I, I, guess I don't understand why we choose our heart to be this place that we kind of describe. You know, it's as where our emotions flow out of. But the heart itself is just a, a bodily function that's circulating the blood. It's important. It's kind of a weird thing. It's more of a metaphor, right? It's obviously a metaphor. It's, uh, I found some stuff. To the Hebrews, the heart was the center of feelings. You ever heard that before? That's where their feelings came from. To the Greeks, the word heart, it meant uh, our, your desire, where you deliberately made choices, where you decided to do things. Your heart, metaphorically speaking here, it's where our thoughts, you know, it's where our soul is, resides, it's where our, our, you know, our mind, you know, our mind's up here, but our decision making comes from our heart. And when you hear these types of things, uh, the Amplified Bible translation, it describes verse 23 like this. It says, above all, guard your heart, for it affects everything you do. You know, so for, the wellspring, for it is the wellspring of life is the NIV. But I appreciate it saying it affects everything you do, your heart. So guard your heart. Now, I found an old Sunday school story. Think, when you hear the word Sunday school in childhood, what do you think of? You know, I don't know what you think of. You think of a, a person who's probably long gone now. You think of something kind of crazy that that teacher might have done. Well, I remember a story that went kind of like this, and I think you'll, re you'll recognize it too. Uh, it's called a Sunday school fable. It's of a mouse who is constantly in distress. The mouse is constantly worried because of his fear for who? Who is the mouse afraid of? A cat. Who do you think? <laughs> the, the mouse is afraid of... Uh, the mouse traps that Ruth Moreland might have, I guess. Okay. We just got one. Oh, could you bring it so I can use it for an illustration? No. Got a picture of it. No, that's okay. Back to my fable. A mouse is not afraid of humans yet. Yet in the story, 
a mouse is afraid of a cat. All right, cats, are, they chase down mice. In this story, uh, the, ma- the, the mouse prays to God to change him into something else. God takes pity on him. God changes this mouse, guess what, into a cat. Hope you haven't killed any cats lately. No. <laughs> Immediately, this mouse that's become a cat becomes fearful. Why? Because now it's afraid of who? The dog. The story goes on. The dog gets fearful of a tiger for some reason. I don't know why. The, the end of the story goes something like this. Uh, you know, the, becomes a ti- dog, tiger, becomes afraid of a hunter. Now we're to the hunter, the human. Then God says to the, I guess it's now a tiger, no matter what you become, you will still have the heart of a mouse. Be a mouse again and let me change your heart. Nothing else will help. And that's the end of the story. Let me change your heart, God says. Be who you are. Let me change your heart. So back to this, you know, this blood circulator. So it's, it's, it's two things at once. We're told to exercise, unfortunately. We're told to eat well. A lot of us covered that this week, right? We ate well. We ate enough in two days to cover the rest of the week. Can I get a, uh, yeah, oh yeah, yeah. Our hearts, you know, we're told by medical professions to exercise, to eat well, to manage our stress, okay? But what does our creator say about our hearts? It says it right there. Guard your heart, for it is the wellspring. For that, uh, you know, guarding our hearts, I want us to know what God wants us to know. So we're going to use that outline with the scriptures that I got from Wally. We're going to look through this together. But I want us to pray about what we just talked about and then lead us into just about five points. You can write down on your your bulletin. You can write down wherever you want to. But I want you to to be hearing these scriptures and letting them assist you as you guard your heart. Let's pray. God, we're going to go through your word today. We're going to be in a few different places. I thank you for for this proverb that we just read. You're a loving God who tells us to seek you, to seek wisdom, to guard our hearts above God all things. So we pray, God, that you will search our hearts and that you will know our thoughts. And we pray, God, that if there's wicked things in us, you'll you'll, you'll help us on the path of righteousness. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so for, for quite some time, we'll have the scriptures pop up, but you're more than welcome to turn with me or to write them down as we go through them. But here's what I want to do. What do you know? Well, you all know a lot. And I bet you combined we could even do pretty good on Jeopardy. You know, I don't know if we combine our, combine our strength of our minds, maybe. <laughs> but I want you to know today what God wants you to know, okay? So we're going to write down five things God wants us to know. We'll go through two or three scriptures for each one. Here's how it goes. The first thing from this outline that I found and definitely approve of and support, it goes like this. God wants you to know that God formed you, okay? If you hear nothing else, know that God formed you. That should matter. In fact, the more I hear of all these uh, astrophysicists and, and people searching the, the far reaches of our universe, and the more they're dumbfounded, to be honest with you, the more they're confounded and dumbfounded about the, the greatness of this universe and how it mu- there must be something out there, the more I appreciate the fact that my creator not only made that, but he made me. He made you. How amazing is that? Let's go to Genesis chapter 1. Verses 26 and verse 27. Then God said, and here are the first two words what God said. Let us, let us make man in our image, in our our likeness. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Okay? Now I think it's interesting, and I wanted you to hear that first, the first two words that he said. God refers to himself as let us. If I came up here and said, uh, we're going to preach today, and no one else came up here, you'd think I was a little odd. You might already think I'm a little odd. That's a different story. <laughs> but God says, let us. It's very easy to forget that God is one, and God is also three. Amen. It's easy to forget that because it's hard to understand that, but I accept it. God is both three and God is one. The Bible calls it the Godhead. We call it the Trinity right? The Trinity, God the Father, God Jesus Christ the Son, our Lord, and the Holy Spirit, they're all called God. Now what happens in our society, God means God the Father, and then we specify the Holy Spirit, we specify Jesus. Does that make sense? We've just done that over time. 
So how are we made in God's image? It's pretty obvious that God didn't uh, create us exactly like him. I mean, we, we don't have a, God doesn't have a physical body that I know of. I mean, Jesus Christ was a physical body, but the Godhead doesn't have a body to represent us. It's described in our Bible that we are a reflection of God's glory. So you are formed as a reflection of God's glory. You and I, uh, we're not God. Hear that. We're not God. But we're formed in his image. We are not the creator. But we do have the ability to create. We have the ability and character like God to love, to be patient, to show kindness, to show forgiveness, and to be faithful. We are formed by God as a reflection of him. And we're seeing right there, so if you did turn in your Bible to Genesis 1, the first chapter of the Bible, uh, you're, you're seeing these things. In verse 27 again, God made both man and woman in his image. Neither man nor woman is made more in the image of God than the other. And we're seeing right there in the first chapter of the Bible, the very first chapter of the Bible, that God places man, man and woman, as the pinnacle of all he created. So the more we think the greatness is out there, realize, just like I said, guard your heart. Realize that what you have inside of you, you're formed by God. Neither gender is better than the other. In fact, uh, I would encourage men to think women are more important, and I would encourage women to think men are more important. If we have that uh, attitude of humility like Jesus had, that would be amazing. But God formed each of us. In fact, great verse, Psalm 139, verses 13 and 14 say, for you created my inmost being. Don't forget Proverbs 4, verse 23. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. Isn't that a fun uh, piece of imagery? I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I know that full well. So did you hear that? So that's uh, a really cool verse out of the Psalms. Our creator took time to shape us from the inside first and then the outside. I don't want to go off on a side illustration that's just popping into my head, but about a week, 10 days ago, we were down at the bakery and Josh Heim was doing his pottery work, right? And it's amazing seeing him make each unique uh, glass and cu cup and plate. And all. And in fact, while the kids were all standing around, he would stare at them and kind of change things around on the mold of the clay. God is what? He is the potter, and we are his clay. How amazing is that? We are, you know, just the way he wants us. Each of us, unique. No two thumbprints are alike, I don't think. So we are marvelous, marvelously made. We are uh, made in a breathtaking way to our creator. And our God, he knows everything about us because he made us. He knows the inside. He knows the out. He knows exactly who we are because he is the sculptor. Now listen to one more passage on this. So again, I just focusing in on the first thing God wants us to know. He wants us to know what? That we are formed by him. God formed you. God wants you to know he formed you. Jeremiah's words, they were very, when I read this the first time in Jeremiah, I thought, man, this guy's kind of uh, confident when he's saying this. It's right there in the beginning, chapter 1. Chapter 1 of Jeremiah, he went to confront Israel, which happened several times. And Jeremiah says in verses 4 and 5, he says, the word of the Lord came to me saying, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Now, he is talking specifically about one man right there in Jeremiah 1, 4 and 5. God knew Jeremiah. God knew Jeremiah long before Jeremiah was born. God knows you. God knew you long before you were born. In fact, uh, as I was getting those Christmas tree ornaments out, I saw one that said 2000 and, what did it say? 2001 maybe, or 19, I can't, 1995 I think it was, that had the back, the, number, the, the date on it. I said, Lincoln, you weren't even a thought yet. He was there helping me. I said, and I, I probably should have said, as a good father, that God knew you back then. In fact, I might recreate that scene later on today. But God knew us before we were even conceived, even before we were born. God knew Jeremiah. So whenever I feel inadequate, whenever you feel inadequate or discouraged, whenever these things are going on, remember that you are valuable to God, just like Jeremiah was valuable to God. He has a purpose for us. That's the first thing that I want you to know. The first thing that, we need, that God wants us to know, uh, the reason I let off with this, the reason we're acknowledging the fact that we're formed by the Creator, that we're made in God's image, we have His characteristics, we, we have 
what it takes. I want to provide you with encouragement right now. Before we go to the other four things, God made you. Know that. In fact, know that because it's about to be a couple things that we don't like to point out, but some other things that we need to know that God wants us to know. So I want to encourage you. I want to reiterate that God says in his word, by his mouth, that you are important and you're made in his image. So I hope that makes sense. Okay? Now, continuing on, feeling positive about ourselves, we're going to spend a couple minutes. I won't, spend, I won't dwell on this too long, but as ministers, we should. God wants us to know the second thing. God wants us to know not only are we formed by him, but we are misinformed by Satan. So you're going to see a great outline here. And if you are writing these down, it's beautifully put together. Thank you, Victor, not Ethan. But Satan has misinformed you. Go back to the beginning of the Bibles. So we were just in Genesis 1. Hey, how cool is it? Man and woman created in God's image. Ah, in there, please. Nope, it keeps going. Go to chapter 3. We'll look at verse 1. We'll look at verse 4. Now the serpent. Ugh. You know what? I dislike the devil so much. When I'm typing up my notes, and it comes to typing the word Satan and the word devil, uh, it, I, I never want to capitalize it, because I always capitalize God, Lord, Jesus, to give him praise and glory. When I'm, I'm always put capital J or capital G. I don't like doing a capital S or capital D, and I always get the red underline on Microsoft Word, and that drives me crazy because i got kind of an analytical brain. But I don't want to honor Satan at all, because he is a jerk. In fact, let me reread this, and when I say the word serpent, go ahead and give me your best hiss out there, okay? When I say the word serpent, don't jump early. Now the serpent. Ugh. Ugh. It's okay to say hate for that guy. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the, to the woman, who? The serpent. The serpent said to the woman, did God really... Ugh, did God really say, you must not eat from any tree in the garden? I don't like that. Continuing on a few verses later. The serpent, you will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman. <laughs> Thank you. For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. The devil disguised himself as a serpent, a disgusting animal. Who likes snakes? Maybe a one or two people, not a lot of us. I, when I read through this, temptations equals bad. Satan loves doing this trick on us. What tempts you? You should have a different answer. You might have the same answer. What tempts you? Realize that Satan is going to misinform you He's probably going to do similar to what he did with the first man, with the first woman. He's going to find a way to encourage you to just follow those temptations. And I want to remind you, don't do it. I don't want to dwell much longer on this, but God wants you to know that Satan misinformed you. Now, that was Genesis, book one. Go about 65 books later, you'll get to the 66th book of the Bible, Revelation. In fact, Revelation chapter 12 in verse 9, it says, the great dragon. So we've changed from what I said before, I want you to hiss this time, to a dragon. Verse 9, the great dragon. I guess you could go, you could get like a flame torch out and do it out of your mouth if you wanted to right now. The great dragon was hurled down. That ancient serpent called the devil, or Satan, who led the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. Satan wants to take as many away from God as he can. He doesn't care if he's going to hurt you, which he's going to. He wants to hurt God. Okay? We are created not in Satan's image, in God's image. God wants you to know, to prepare yourself, hey, I did form you. I loved creating you uniquely. But there's going to be some things here on earth we're going to have to deal with. And Satan is going to misinform you. In fact, let's just go ahead and uh, let's go to point three. That's kind of a part two of this one. You can write this down. God wants you to know that sin deformed you. Does that make sense? Sin equals bad. Sin equals bad people. My family just read through the Noah's Ark story. Fantastic story. But it's not as much as a children's story as you think, right? We think that's a children's story. 
Well, only like eight people out of what I assume is millions survived a great flood. Okay? I have the ark somewhere laying around, but you don't see the scratch marks on the wood from the people trying to get in the ark, do you? God was disgusted. He wanted to end the human race. That's crazy. In fact, let's pick up on this story. In Genesis chapter 6, verse 5, the Lord saw how great the wickedness was of you and me, the human race, how great the wickedness had become on the earth, and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart, there's the heart again, Proverbs 4, verse 23, every inclination of the thoughts of the heart, human heart was only evil all the time. I'm thankful I'm here. I have Noah and his wife, Ham, Japheth, and, and Shem, and, and their wives to thank for that. But God hates sin. God is offended by sin. God cannot be around sin. The only reason we have God is because of that amazing sacrifice that was talked about by Andrew in the communion meditation. What we sing about constantly, for God so loved the world that he did what? He gave his one and only son. The reason we have a relationship with God is because his son, Jesus, takes away your sin. Skip forward after Genesis, where he kills almost everyone. You get to Isaiah 59, and I want to read the New Life version. Keep your NIV Bibles or NASB Bibles or King James Version Bibles open. But I'm going to read the New Life version of Isaiah 59, verses 1, 2, and 3. See, the Lord's hand is not so short that it cannot save. Thank you, Lord, for saving us. And that's going to come, Isaiah is saying. It says, and his ear is not closed that it cannot hear. Thanks again for that. But your wrongdoings, Isaiah is talking to the people, but your wrongdoings have kept you away from God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. For your hands are sinful with blood, your fingers with wrongdoing. Your lips have lied, and your tongue talks about sin. God wants you to know you were created by him. And, of course, he wants you to know that Satan has misinformed you. But we also have to realize that since the beginning, sin has deformed us. In fact, uh, this doesn't get any better. The Old Testament is a little more uh, fire and brimstone than the New, which focuses more on the grace from Jesus Christ. But Paul even quotes King David. So Paul in the New Testament gets you all the way back to the Old Testament. We can't get away from that because it's important. But Paul qu quotes King David in uh, Romans chapter 3, verses 10 through 12. And Paul says, as it is written. So he's talking about something King David said. As it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. Okay? Give me, one, give me a McKinbe Tumbo finger. There is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. Now take that finger and kind of point it right there. Yep. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. Ah, uh, God creates us, but we have become, by our own choice, worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Man, Paul, come on, man. There'll be a lot more come on, mans this year. After quoting King David in this chapter, Romans chapter 3, just a few verses later, Paul adds this. Now we're back to his own words. A few verses later, Paul says in Romans 3, verse 23, for all have sinned, all fall short of the glory of God. Sin deforms you. If I ended there, we'd go out with our shoulders slumped and not very happy. But he made you. He formed you. The devil misinforms you. Sin deforms you. Let's be done with the, the negative stuff. Let's focus on the good stuff. God wants you to know what? The Word of God, number four, the Word of God informs you. Okay, so you just got informed you're bad on your own. You've sinned. You cannot have a relationship with the Holy One on your own. Okay, we need to understand what the Word of God says. The Word should be on our hearts. In fact, Psalm, now hear me here because I'm going to kind of use a few different verses. Psalm 119, kind of a long psalm, right? Psalm 119, we'll look at verse 89, verse 105, and verse 130. I'll read them all together, but these aren't all written together. Here's what it says. Your word, Lord, is eternal. It stands firm in the heavens. 89. 105. Your word is a lamp for my feet and a light for my path. The unfolding of your word gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. God wants you to know the word of God 
informs you. How can, I, how can I take Psalm 119 and make it a modern day illustration? What's one of the first things I encourage you to do today? To put up a Christmas tree. And my family, putting up a Christmas tree means rearranging your entire living room. Anybody else have one of those households? You've got to rearrange everything. That's fine and dandy until dad turns all the lights off. And then guess what? I'm thankful for a wise wife. One of my children, Ren, she's still five. She, oh, about once, twice a week, she wakes up. She bypasses the restroom right by her room and comes and tells us she needs to go to the restroom when she goes in our restroom. Misty made sure she knew last night there is a Christmas tree directly in your path of getting to our room. Okay? I should have, a good dad, would have left the Christmas tree lights on so there'd be a light for her feet to see where she's going, her path, right? But her dad's a cheapskate, so he pulls the plug about 11 o'clock. But she needs to know what's going on. She's have a path to get to mom and dad. We're hearing right here, the word of God is the path you take. It's the way we understand. It's what we need because it was from God to you. One of the best verses of the Bible, you, I hope you know it, is 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. You'll know it if you, if you didn't, you'll know it now. All scripture is God-breathed, and it's useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Okay, that's beautiful. I don't need to say any more because I want to get to point number five. So the word of God informs you. That here's my favorite part. He is the reason for the season. God wants you to know this. Jesus can transform you. So up to this point, uh, well, as the old Bible would say, we are, uh, let's just say we have a ticket reserved, not in heaven, but in hell. So I appreciate the fifth and final point. I don't want to spend eternity away from God, even though I've made mistakes and deserve it. Let me explain what's going on. While, while preaching in Acts chapter 2, so like I'm talking to you, Peter is talking to a crowd, and Peter says in the 28th verse, you have made known to me the paths of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. Peter, again, Peter like Paul, quotes King David. David wasn't writing about himself, uh, but he was writing about the one, the Messiah, the one to come. You have made known to me the paths of life, and you will fill me with joy in your presence. Okay, Peter's preaching on Jesus. Then Paul preaches on Jesus as well. He's writing to the church of Corinth. He says in 2 Corinthians uh, 5, 17, here's what he says. Let me get my... 2 Corinthians 5, 17, he says the following. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. I love that. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. If anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the NIV says. The old is gone, the new is here. You deserved hell, through Christ you receive heaven. Right? I love this. In fact, let me read my note in my Bible here. Christians are brand new people. On the inside, the Holy Spirit gives them new life. And they are not the same anymore. But let me just go ahead and say this isn't all uh, fluffy and we just get to float around and do what we want. We go from slaves to sin to slaves to Christ. Jesus is our Lord. And then we receive eternity with God. In fact, uh, tying back in with what was said by Shanna and continuing to grow, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18 says, but grow. Let's say grow together. But grow. Okay, 2 Peter 3, 18. But grow in the grace of and knowledge of our Lord, of your Lord, and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory, both now and forever. Amen. 2 Peter 3, 18. Now, at least three or four times a year, I can almost use like a second Bible, a hymn. Because hymns are almost purely scripture. And the hymn, softly and tenderly, says, Though we have sinned, he has mercy and pardon." Pardon for you and for me. Right? Does that make sense? My closing verse is 1 Thessalonians 5, 9. I'm just going all through God's word because God's word is good. 1 Thessalonians 5, 9. For God did not appoint us to wrath. Well, thank you. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. 
So if you believe all Scripture is God-breathed, is useful for teaching and for rebuking, then you need to hear those words. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. I love that. I love hearing that. And what do I know? Not a whole lot. But what does God want me to know? What do I know now? I hope I know a whole lot more. We just talked about five things that God wants you to know. Now, I hope you have a better idea of, of what that relationship with God is all about. In fact, uh, Christ should be the Lord of your heart, where everything of life overflows. And if Christ is not the Lord of your life, where everything overflows, please do not delay in making a relationship with Him your priority. Please don't debay, uh, delay, but obey. I found that. Please do not delay, but obey. Who do we obey? Christ. The faith that saves, again quoting, the faith that saves is the faith that obeys. That's what God wants us to know. Let's take that with us as we're turning our attention to Jesus Christ, who came from heaven to earth to not only show us the way, but to die for us. That's on our hearts, and that's overflowing from our hearts. Let's pray about this as a family, and I'll encourage you to stand and sing with us together. God, we stay busy, and that's okay to a certain extent. We stay busy, and we fill ourselves with so much that's not as important as our continued relationship, our growing relationship with you. So I pray these five points that, uh, that were shared, uh, things that you want us to know, starting with the fact that you formed us, I hope they're on the tips of our tongues, definitely in our hearts where our, our life overflows from, I pray, God, that you will take control, that we who are dead to sin, who have chosen to follow you, who have been baptized into the faith of believers, who have the Holy Spirit, I pray, God, that Jesus Christ will direct us, will teach us, will rebuke us when need be, and because of his love, we are allowed to know you. God, I pray that we know as a family how important it is to have that relationship with you. So the busyness of Thanksgiving and online shopping and paying attention to vaccines and whatever else is going on, don't let that take the place in our minds and our hearts of our relationship with you. We all pray this together in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Won't you stand while we finish this morning?
you for worshiping with us today.